Uh, let's pray, and then we'll jump right in. Lord, I thank you for this opportunity. Lord, I thank you for the honor of being able to bring your word to this body of believers. Lord, I ask that you'll let the meditation of my heart, the words of my mouth be pleasing to you, communicate clearly what you laid on my heart, and Lord, that your name will be glorified as we go through this service in Jesus' name. Amen. My source text this morning comes from a, uh, a likely very familiar scripture for, for you. It's from the greatest, in my opinion, the greatest sermon of all times, uh, affectionately known as the Sermon on the Mount, when, pa when our pastor, Jesus, <laughs> uh, preached this sermon to the multitudes on the Sea of Galilee, on the shores of the Sea of Galilee. And uh, it's something that I, I trust you'll be familiar with, and hopefully you'll stick with me to the end and don't tune me out too soon so that you have an opportunity to hear maybe a different perspective on this scripture. Read with me, if you will, though, from Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 through 16. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Again, I hope that you won't tune me out because we've probably all heard that scripture more times than we can imagine or remember. It's a very popular scripture and one that maybe you've seen on a tweet or an uh, inspirational calendar, maybe a t-shirt. It's something that we use rather often. You are the light of the world. You are the light of the world. But sometimes when, when something is very familiar to us, it's helpful to step back and try to look at it from a different perspective because when something is unfamiliar, we look at it through different eyes. But before I get there, I, uh, I do want to say how much I've enjoyed this uh, fine city. I had the opportunity to come yesterday and uh, we, we traveled around, we got to do a lot of tourism and see all of the different historical sites, the popular locations, and quite honestly, uh, you have a great bit of beauty here and a big a big difference, you know, quite the spread and variation between the high-tech city, the old city, some of the historical locations. Very much enjoyed getting to be here. I was here once before in my life. Um, that was in 2005, I mentioned, and I, I really didn't get to visit because I was staying here on a layover as I was traveling through to another city, and I believe it was a pastor from this fine church that helped to arrange my stay that evening, um, but I didn't get to really meet anybody or see anything, so I'm, I'm grateful to have that opportunity. I come to you today uh, bivocational, like many of the staff, it appears, that are here at the church. My background is in communications. Um, I, I uh, have done the majority of my graduate and postgraduate work in the area of strategic communications, and basically, what does that mean? Well, if you ask my family, it means that I can talk myself out of anything. Um, my, my daughter, many times, Gabriella, she, uh, I'm still hurting a little bit by this one, actually. Uh, she, she thinks that I can be a little manipulative because I can use communications as my little superpower in that get out of jail free card. Like I said, I'm still a little hurt by that. But I like communications. I like to, to look at signs and symbols and find out how people have attributed meaning to different things and how that meaning has impacted when people communicate. I like to study the reception of communication from different things and how people transmit communication, all things communication. Basically, I'm a communication nerd. Well, I also work in technology. Um, I, as, you, as you heard, uh, Got a technology company in the area of broadcast television called Arc Multicasting. And uh, the bivocational part is I'm, I'm on staff at my church back in Dallas since 2004. My wife and I lead the worship there and we've uh, been serving with uh, preaching and different things in the associate pastor role 
since that time. But what does communications have to do with this service or this passage? Can I tell you sometimes I think I have a problem? Um, my family does too. I, I study people too much. I like to just people watch. Does anybody else in here ever just sit down and watch people as they go by? And you're, you know, you might not talk about what's taking place, but you observe how people interact with one another. Or you just watch as they walk through the shopping center or engage with one another. I like to people watch. And when you're traveling a long distance, as we did coming here, there's a lot of opportunity for people watching. I like to then psychoanalyze or at least in my opinion, I'm doing a psychoanalysis of people as I'm people watching. I like to psychoanalyze, what is this person thinking? How do they identify themselves? What is, what is motivating this individual at this point in the conversation or is I'm observing them? Like I said, I'm a nerd. Well, on the way here, I can remember one of those times, I'm sitting in the airport or, or rather walking through the airport and I see uh, a man, he was in his late 50s, early 60s, had a, a gray beard, and uh, he had a, a brief or a, a rolling suitcase. And on that small rolling suitcase, there was another smaller bag that was kind of strapped, bungeed to the top of it. This man had a white, nicely pressed collared shirt, nice dark slacks. On this collared shirt, he had like a blue rectangular thing on his shoulders with little gold stripes. Um, I could tell as he was walking through the airport, he really wasn't engaging with anybody. He wasn't talking to people. He wasn't saying excuse me as he passed somebody. He didn't really uh, have to ask for things or, or have opportunities for please and thank you because he kind of walked uh, like, he, like he owned the place a little bit. Now, not in a disrespectful way, but you could tell this person was not like the rest of the people walking. And yes, you probably have already assumed the same thing I assumed with all of my education and expertise. This man was a pilot. You see, he was walking around like he owned the place simply because he was pretty much at the top of the food chain. When he was not on the airplane, he was only identified as a pilot because of the way he was dressed. While he was on the airplane, he's identified as a pilot because he's piloting, right? That's pretty simple. You got that one for free. You could also see as you were walking around the airport, other people that would walk in, in groups, many times wearing the same, the same outfit, like a suit of some kind, or uh, a, a, a nice dress of some kind, or you know, a, a business outfit. These were flight attendants, and it was easy to identify them because of the way they were dressed as well. They engaged with one another differently than they do when they're on the airplane, because when they're on the airplane, they're attending the flight, to the flight. They're taking care of people, they're serving people. But it's funny, I didn't see them serving anybody as they walked through the airport. Because when they were walking through the airport, their identity was pretty much because of what they were wearing, not because of what they were doing. Again, I understand that this might not seem like uh, rocket science. Perhaps I didn't need all that ed education. Why am I pointing these, these, these things out? Well. One of the things that was very interesting to me as I started going through the educational side of my training was something that was posited in the 1960s by a man named Marshall McLuhan. Marshall McLuhan, he coined a phrase, the medium is the message. The medium is the message. Now he was somewhat concerned about technological advances, um, but he was trying to warn that the vehicle with which a message is communicated, is communicating a message all by itself, and oftentimes more loudly than the message that's intended to be communicated. I'll, I'll say that again. What he was meaning with the phrase, the medium is the message, is that the vehicle or the medium with which a message is being communicated is oftentimes communicating a message all by itself independent of the message that was intended. Okay, so what does, that really, what does that really mean here? Well, if you were to see a black and white television, a big tube television, it would communicate a time or an era of communications. 
because we don't watch black and white televisions on tube TVs anymore. He talked about things like radio or, you know, on the television side, many times it's communicating a familial experience where people gather around the television and watch TV together, or so it used to be. Social media oftentimes communicates something that if it's posted on social media, we have a fair guess that it may not be the whole story because people only post the best things, the best image, and never the bad stuff when it comes to social media. If I were to be up here today wearing a bright floral bathing suit and a lei, perhaps some sunglasses, and maybe I've got a bunch of white sunscreen filling my nose, my fair complected skin would appreciate that, Irrespective of what I said to you, before I said a word, I will have already communicated quite a bit. Correct? That's essentially what medium is the message is all about. Well, if I walked through that airport wearing a black suit, black tie, or not even a tie, a collar that was black with a little white rectangle showing at the front, everybody would assume I'm a priest or a reverend. If I walked through the airport like this with the briefcase, they would assume I'm a businessman because we identify things by the way they're packaged. I know these things don't take a scholar, but the medium communicates something independent of the message that's intended. I grew up with five brothers and sisters. I didn't hear any awes or sorry, but that's okay. I grew up with five brothers and sisters and while I was a saint among my siblings, there were times when I was growing up that we fought. And I can remember times when my, my parents would say, Joshua, apologize to your brother. Now, how many of you know an apology is simply, I'm sorry. But back to the medium is the message. If I were to say, I'm sorry. I said the words, but communicated something much differently. The reason I'm bringing this all up to you is because in studying communications, one thing that has become extremely interesting to me is wanting to look back in history and see how is it that God chose to communicate his message to humanity? What mediums did God choose to say I want to use this to communicate about me. How did God interact with creation, with mankind? How does he interact with us today? How does communication work with the creator of the universe? I find this very interesting. So with that, let's go back to the source text. And I promise I'll start preaching soon. Verse 13, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. This message today is entitled, You Are the Light of the World. And I'll be focusing on verses 14 through 16. And I think that it's healthy to take an exegetical approach when preaching the scripture, meaning I don't want to preach simply what I want to preach and find scriptures to support my comments. Rather, I'd like to just extract out what the intention was in the original text and then preach the message that the text was originally intending to preach. Good exegesis. So, with that, I'm gonna take time on the first point, which is, you are the light of the world. I bet you couldn't have guessed that. It's easy, as I mentioned, to see this on a t-shirt, or a tweet, or a nice calendar, inspirational cal calendar, but in order to properly explain how I view this scripture in the context of the things we've just been speaking about, I'd like to spend a little bit more time 
and go back in time to lay out how God has communicated himself to humanity throughout history. And I believe that if we take a little bit more time on this first section, then perhaps the next two points may be of greater clarity. So forgive me for being a little bit more long-winded and uh, professor-ish on this first point, but bear with me and try not to tune me out if you'll be so kind. The mediums that God has used for biblical communication throughout history are of great interest to me. It started with oral communications, meaning the spoken word, and then went to the scroll form or a written form. From the written form, it went to another version of a written form, kind of like a book or a codex, and then the printed book and then digital, and here we are today, right? How though, how though, can we be confident that the word of God is truly inerrant? If something started from an oral standpoint, how good can it be? It's difficult sometimes when we think of it between oral and the literate or the, the written word, because I come from a literate culture. I come from literacy, a culture where we read, we write. That doesn't mean we do all of that often, but we are, we are formed by the mediums that we communicate with, the signs and symbols. If I were to try and recite to you some scriptures, the likelihood is I may lean on looking at the Word of God to make sure I get them right. But somebody who comes from an oral culture, they can say the things back to you with precision time and time again, which is of great interest to me. I don't think it should be lost, though, that God started the entirety of our story with the oral Word. It didn't have to be written down first. There was no transla translation of it that took place where it was then scribe, you know, put on a, a scroll. No, the Lord simply said, let there be light. He spoke the world into existence. He chose the oral word. Biblical scholars agree that biblical literature actually originated with oral tradition. This took place for thousands of years, where it was oral tradition passed down from one generation to the next, which is Again, something that I, I struggle with at times until I start studying a little bit more. You see, the Word of God didn't go to a print form or a written form in the form of a scroll until sometime between the 7th and the 8th century before the Common Era. So you're talking about a few thousand years of oral tradition and then we decide to write it down in a scroll. This shouldn't be something that is too concerning, though, because... Homer's Iliad and Odyssey. These two books are widely recognized as some of the greatest examples of epic poetry in Western civilization. They were both oral compositions, just like the one I described in the Word of God. They were, they were written, in quotation marks, sometime between the 12th and the 13th century before the Common Era, and they didn't go down into scroll form until between the 7th and 8th century just like the Word of God. And yet, nobody ever questions the validity of Homer's Iliad and Odyssey. They're revered. In case you uh, may not know some of the timelines for our biblical history, I, I have a graph here that comes from Answers in Genesis. And you'll see that, according to Answers in Genesis, they believe that creation of the world, they take a young earth view, creation of the world took place around 4,000 B.C. If you take what I just talked about, the seventh, between the 7th and 8th century, look, look down that list. The Assyrian destruction of Israel. The Word of God was not put into scroll form, into written form, until everything above that line had already taken place and been passed down from generation to gen generation in oral form. That's remarkable to me, remarkable. Now, I still am very interested in this process, and so I'm gonna deviate just a, just a little bit. Where did it go from there? Well, 
scrolls were written by hand by scribes all around Israel. Not everybody was literate. In fact, during the time of Jesus, 95% of the common people were not literate. They could not read. This is why they would read the scroll from the stage. The rabbi would, would read it. And this is why it was done that way, because people did not know how to read. But scrolls were done throughout the area, especially a group called the Essenes in the desert of, of Judea. And these Essenes wrote what we now know to be called the Dead Sea Scrolls. What are the Dead Sea Scrolls? This is the oldest scrolls that we have of the Bible. They date back to about 300 BC. And the, the, these Essene scribes, they knew that the Romans were coming and it, they were going to destroy everything and they were concerned. So what did they do? They took these scrolls, they put them into clay jars, and they hid those clay jars into the caves of the mountain in Qumran, Israel. Remarkable. Well, they were hidden a couple hundred years before Christ. Those scrolls stayed hidden until 1949. Thousands of years. So what do we do in between the time of those scrolls and today? Well, there was this new technology called the Codex where they would take they would take papyrus and they would put it in more like a book form, the way you and I know it today. And these, these papyrus codex books or codices would be transcribed or, or written by the scribes and they would be cared for just like the scrolls. In fact, the Christian church was, is responsible for even the Hebrew Bible that the Jewish people use the Christian Bible, the, of course, the Christians use, the, the Christians were responsible because of their way of taking care of the codices throughout the Middle Ages. That's how we actually got most of the Bibles that we use. These were copies translated into English or Hindi or Telugu, translated, and that's how we've got our various versions. We were, most of these were using codices, which are dated much later. In fact, the oldest codex that we have is like from 400 AD, hundreds of years after Christ. And that's how we get the validity of our scriptures, which can be a little bit unnerving, right? Well, let's, let's fast forward though to 1949. Do you know that when they discovered a Bedouin in the desert of Judea in the Qumran area was throwing a rock into a cave. He saw a cave and he heard a clank. And so he climbed up and he found what we know now know as the Dead Sea Scrolls. When they open up those Dead Sea Scrolls, dated hundreds of years before the Codex, our oldest Codex, and they look at the comparison between our version of the Bible and those scrolls that were dated from a few hundred years before Christ. Remarkably accurate remarkably accurate. The accuracy is so impressive, so impressive because it tells us that what we have been believing for all these years is not just because people told us that we should believe. Now there's even more evidence that the Word of God that we read is so accurate, inerrant, inspired Word of God. It's living and active, sharper than a double-edged sword. It penetrates to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of our heart. Friends, the Word of God is powerful. And God chose to communicate His message through the Word of God. Remarkable. Ah, until He changed something, He added something. It's true. The Lord chose to communicate initially through the oral world. And as he spoke the world into existence, creation has testified of our God since the foundations of the world. Creation is one of the greatest testimonies of God. And then he said, ah, oh, I can do more. And he added the, the, the word of God in scroll form, oral form, then scroll form, then codex form, and so forth. And then he said, 
the plan that's been there the whole time, the living word of God, the living word of God. In John chapter one, verses one through five, he says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Fast forward to verse 14, and it says, The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. So let's recap. Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. It says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was, with, was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. God chose an oral medium to speak the world into existence. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The Word was with God at that point. And God's perfect moment in time, he sent that Word to be communicated in flesh through the person of Jesus Christ. In other words, God chose a new medium to communicate himself, the living word, Christ Jesus. And do remember, in him was life, and life was the light of all mankind, which is consistent with what we see in the New Testament. In John chapter 8, verses 12 through 19, Jesus says to the Pharisees, when Jesus spoke to again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Now the Pharisees, they challenged him. They said, here you are, appearing as your own witness. Your testimony is not valid. Jesus answered, even if I testify, testify on my own behalf, my testimony is valid, for I know where I came from and where I am going. But you, <laughs> you have no idea where I come from or where I'm going. You judge by human standards. I pass judgment on no one. But if I do judge... My decisions are true, because I am not alone. I stand with the Father who sent me. In your own law, it is written that the testimony of two witnesses is true. I am the one who testifies for myself. My other witness is the Father who sent me. Then they asked him, who is your father? You do not know me or my father, Jesus replied. If you knew me, you would know my father also. So Jesus was the word made flesh. He said that he's the light of the world. He is the light of the world. <coughs> Which, again, it's consistent with Genesis chapter 1, but I, I'm, I'm still confused, though, because now we have a bit of <coughs> what seems to be a contradiction. I get, in the beginning was the Word. The Lord said, let there be light. And that light is life for all mankind. Get that. Jesus comes along, Word made flesh. God shows a new medium to communicate His message through the person of Jesus Christ, Christ, the living Word. Jesus says, He is the light of the world. But now we go back to our source text in Matthew chapter 5, verse 14, and it says, this is Jesus, the light of the world, saying, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. You see, I don't believe the you in that scripture is intended to be an individualistic you. I think God had a very intentional plan. He had a plan that he was going to no longer only use the existing mediums for communicating his message. He was continuing his plan and has now made you the church, the body of Christ, to be the light of the world. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl instead, 
They put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house, which brings me to the second point. It shouldn't be hidden. You, church, light of the world, should not allow that light to be hidden. In fact, it would be almost impossible to let that light be hidden if the light is truly in you. You need to know your identity as light. The problem that we have oftentimes within modern day Christianity is that we take our faith and we put our faith as an adjective to who we are. Meaning, when we identify ourselves or we talk about who we are, we might reference ourselves as a professor or a Christian professor, a mechanic or a Christian mechanic, a lawyer, a Christian lawyer. Our identity oftentimes comes in what we do on our day-to-day -day basis as a vocation and not as often as our faith. Our faith has become an adjective. And I believe, friends, this, this is a problem. This is a problem. Because if we are truly the medium that God has chosen to communicate his message to all creation, then it's a full-time job. We cannot simply say we are a mechanic who happens to be a Christian or a teacher who happens to be a... No, no. We are a follower of Christ, and everything that we do within our life is to continue being the light that God has called us to be because we are the light of the world. That's our identity. That pilot that I talked about earlier, if he was in the, in the airport walking around, he is only identified as a pilot because he wears certain clothes. When he's flying the plane, he's clearly a pilot because he's piloting. When the flight attendant is walking through the airport, they're not serving people because they're only identified as a flight attendant because of what they're wearing. But when they're on the airplane, they're serving people, so they are identified easily because they're doing, not just looking. Friends, if I were to ask that pilot, when you get home at night, are you thinking pilot? No. No, the pilot's probably just going to be relaxing, putting his feet up on the couch maybe, watching some TV. If a mechanic or a plumber goes home or electrician goes home, they don't want to go home and continue doing plumbing and electrician work. They want to go home and, and turn that off. There is no off switch to the light of the world. <clears throat> there is no off switch. <clears throat> because the city on a hill cannot be hidden. You know what else that means? If that city on a hill with all those lights, you know, I'm so impressed by Hyderabad, by the way. When I came in 2005, the population of Hyderabad was just over six million people. If I asked everybody in here to guess how many people are in Hyderabad and tell the neighbor next to you, I'd be curious what you'd say, but I don't have time to poll each and every one of you. I'm curious though, maybe whisper to your neighbor, how many people do you think are in Hyderabad? Go on, whisper to your neighbor. It's okay, You're, you have my permission to talk in church. <clears throat> okay, if you said six million, clearly you'd not been paying attention and you should rewind the message. If you said, 10.8 million people, you would be correct. It is equal or larger than the third largest city in the United States of America. That is impressive. And you know what? From all around, Hyderabad cannot be hidden. There is no hiding Hyderabad. The lights of the city cannot just be turned off. There is, there is an energy here because there's 10.8 million people here. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. That also means that those lights are on for potential enemies. Those lights are on for those who may want what you have. Those lights are on for those who have ill will towards you. But guess what? Nothing should stop us from keeping the lights on because we are the light of the world. That's our identity. That's our calling. We are the medium with which Christ has chosen, which with the Lord has chosen to communicate his message to all creation. We have a calling as the church to be the light of the world that cannot be turned off. Cannot be turned, back, turned off. So how do we do that? It's the Christ in you. 
It's not you. If you think that you're the light of the world because you simply talk a good game, wear the right clothes, show up at church, then I'm sorry, you're missing the point. That's just like the pilot. He's identified as a pilot in the airport, but he's not piloting. No, no. It's the Christ in you. So if you really want to be a proper light of the world, then you have to die to self. You have to continue going after God. You have to make sure that everything you do in your life is for the purpose and perspective of making sure that you're a proper light. It doesn't matter the color, the temperature of that light. You're the light. How do you do that? Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Folks, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me and through me and beyond me. <clears throat> I can be the light of the world because I have the light of the world living in me. That's how that works. And guess what? He was and is and will be. He was here at the foundation of the world. He will be here at the end of the world. <clears throat> you can bet on it. James chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee. Come near to the God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Matthew 6, 33. Jesus, at the end of this sermon, he says, but seek first the kingdom of God. You want to know how to be the light? Seek first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough troubles of its own. Folks, friend, church, capital C. If the creator of the universe, the king of kings and lord of lords, the first, the last, the alpha, the omega, father, son, holy spirit, if he is living in you, the single most world-changing being in the history of creation, if he is living in you, then there better be some life change around you because the light of God is living through you and you can't turn that off. So, why? What's the point of this? And I'm wrapping up here, I promise. To point others to God. Matthew 5, verse 14 and 16. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. My friend, Jesus dying on the cross was not plan B. God planned this from the beginning. And you, being the light of the world, the church being the light of the world, is not plan B either. God has continued his journey. You know what? You can't go to the temple and visit the Holy of Holies today. It was destroyed. I think Jesus knew that was going to happen. Guess who the temple of the Holy Spirit is now? It's you and me, the body of Christ. So I reiterate, you are the light of the world so that the world may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. This morning, as we wrap this message up, I challenge you, search your heart. Search your heart and ask if you've been turning that light off. Ask if it's just an adjective to your identity. Ask if it's something that you take as a serious calling, allowing the supernatural creator of the universe living in you and through the light of the world to do something in you so that you can do something beyond you. Because that's how the light of the world works. You don't have to prove how good of a Christian you are. Just live like Christ. Find your identity in Christ. This morning we, we sang the song, House of Miracles. I take this same perspective, Pastor, when I see the House of Miracles. The same perspective. My body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. If miracles aren't happening around me, maybe the miracle worker isn't working in me. Maybe I'm turning it off. If I'm not seeing revival, maybe it's not the world around me. Maybe it's me. Because the supernatural is still living and active. The Word of God is still here. And I'm the light of the world. You are the light of the We are the light of the world. I'll challenge you in the famous words as I close. And the worship team can come back up. In the famous words of St. Francis of Assisi, preach the gospel at all times, 
and if necessary, use words. Thank you very much.